on this Friday night, sending Canadians into harm's way. CBC News has learned Canada will take on a major new peacekeeping deployment. The government set to announce the plan on Monday. But the country's first new mission in years is also one of the UN's most dangerous. So, why are Canadians going to West Africa, and why now? Also tonight, Britain's anger at Russia turns personal, Vladimir Putin the target, and some WestJet flight attendants air their wage complaints. This is The National. Last night, we reported that Canada's involvement in peacekeeping missions was at an all-time low. Well, that is about to change. CBC News has learned Canada is deploying equipment and troops to Mali. That's a country in West Africa. The UN considers it one of its most difficult ongoing operations and certainly one of its deadliest. 162 peacekeepers have been killed there since the mission began in 2013. Now, the CBC's Murray Brewster is breaking this story for us, joins us now. So, Murray, what is the Canadian government doing and when? Well, Andrew, we've learned from government sources that the military is going to deploy helicopters and support troops, including medical personnel, to Mali. The formal announcement is going to come on Monday. It's been a long time coming. The Liberals have been promising a return to peacekeeping and have been getting hammered for not delivering, as you mentioned in your intro. We've been talking about it, and we're talking about it on the program just last night. The troops are not expected to go out the door until later this year. And, Murray, what will this mission actually look like? Well, significantly, Andrew, the peacekeeping mission is going to involve no combat troops. Now, when it comes to helicopters, it is widely expected that they're going to be replacing the German contingent, which has been on the ground for about a year. The Germans have transport and attack helicopters, and they act as a support role to the larger UN peacekeeping force, giving them rides, but also protection from insurgents. Mali has been dangerous for the Germans. Uh, a crash last year killed two of their air crew. Government sources have said that the Canadians are going to be assured that their deployment is going to last for only a year. Now, that's a key requirement for Canada to take on the mission. And, Murray, do, do you have a sense of the timing? I mean, why this mission now? Well, this mission is coming about because the government has been promising for a very, very long time that it uh, is going to deploy peacekeeping troops. Now, Mali has been the most dangerous peacekeeping mission on the books, and it is something that the UN has been asking Canada repeatedly to undertake. And UN peacekeepers have been regularly attacked in Mali, and many other countries have not had the military hardware to be able to go there. Now, Walter Dorn is one of the most highly regarded peacekeeping experts, and he was in Mali earlier this year, and we asked him what he saw and how dangerous it is. I saw in Mali a country that's struggling to keep the peace, struggling to exert government control over wild territories in the north. I saw a UN mission trying to protect the civilian population and really struggling itself to keep the peace and protect the population and build state authority. One of the things I think that we should be watching for on Monday is the timetable for other deployments. The Liberals have given the UN a long list of things that they would like to do, and they have yet to say exactly when they're going to do it. They've been promising military trainers, transport aircraft, and eventually combat troops in the form of a rapid reaction force. We'll be waiting to see what's next when the announcement comes on Monday. Okay, Murray Brewster breaking the story for us. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Now, the UN is trying to hold Mali together after it fell apart in 2012. That's when the central government was overthrown and the country's north went into revolt. That rebellion, initially about ethnic grievances, was commandeered by Islamist militant groups. The French helped recapture the north in 2013, but peace with northern tribes remains unsteady, and groups linked to both ISIS and al-Qaeda continue to launch attacks from remote areas. We'll be following this story as it develops. But, Ian, tonight we're also watching heightening tensions elsewhere, from Moscow to London and from Pyongyang to Washington. Andrew, Donald Trump seems to be set to toughen up his foreign policy team again as he prepares to meet North Korea's leader by the end of May. And as Vladimir Putin gets set for a landslide re-election, some experts wonder where things are headed. We want to piece it all together tonight, beginning with Nala Ayed and the fallout from the poisoning that has made headlines 
where the accusations are now getting personal. Four years to the day since the annexation of Crimea, Vladimir Putin urging his people to vote. Despite consternation abroad, he's about to win another term, though now accused of another serious transgression. Personally ordering the assassination of an ex-Russian spy on British soil. Our quarrel is with Putin's Kremlin and with his decision. And we think it overwhelmingly likely that it was his decision to direct the use of a nerve agent on the streets of, of the UK, on the streets of Europe. It is a significant escalation in what's been a sharp exchange since the poisoning of Sergei Skripal and his daughter, Yulia, who remain in critical condition. Western leaders have lined up to echo Britain in accusing Russia. But in naming Putin now, this has become personal. And a shameful, groundless game, says Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. But it isn't far-fetched, according to Russia critics. Two years ago, a British public inquiry into the poisoning by polonium of another ex-Russian spy here in London concluded it was probably approved by Putin. And there are those here who believe Putin stood to gain from Skripal's assassination. He's saying, don't mess with Russia. This was really useful for the election. It added a real note of sizzle to the end of what had been otherwise a very lackluster campaign. But it also is very useful for the future because it shows that Russia is back and the West is too divided to do anything about it. Moscow has denied involvement, with some accusing Britain of orchestrating the attack, maybe to meddle in Russia's election. Their exchange now crowded with tension. We are ready to play a long game, the results of which won't be very pleasant for the British side, says Russia's ambassador here, Alexander Yakovenko. Putin, meanwhile, is certain to win that election. And so his long standoff with the West, nowhere near over. Nala Ayed, CBC News, London. Well, looking back at the conflict in the Ukraine, the, the cyber attacks to the use of a nerve agent on British soil, there has been a lot of tension between Russia and the West. I spoke with security analyst and author Ian Bremmer earlier today. He calls this a dangerous time and says it could get worse. We're seeing a whole bunch of things that uh, no one has seen between the Americans and the Russians since the days of the Cold War. The most unusual piece of this so far had been that Trump has been unwilling um, to point a finger directly at Putin. But that is starting to change. Uh, the Trump was relatively quick this time around to say that what the Russians likely did, he accepts, um, in the UK, in Salisbury, was unacceptable, would not be tolerated. Uh, the White House itself put out a fairly strong statement as well. Uh, even the strongest critics of Trump on Russia, and there are many, were saying that this was uh, the beginning of perhaps a turn in a different direction. So I think we should watch very carefully. If it turns out that Trump actually has decided that Putin's not such a great friend of his, uh, that Putin is undermining uh, Trump and his administration internationally. And whatever the Russians may or may not have on members of the Trump administration is going to come out through the Mueller investigation anyway. It could be that we're at the beginning of a very dangerous period between the United States and Russia. My conversation with Bremer covered a range of issues, including North Korea, where he had, perhaps surprisingly, praise for the U.S. President, Donald Trump. That's coming up later in the show. When Russians go to the polls on Sunday, there will be eight choices for president besides Putin. But only three are considered prominent, including a former reality TV star. And none can match Putin's dominant profile. Chris Brown followed the frontrunner to a campaign stop and found some rare dissenting voices. Vladimir Putin's path to six more years in power took him through the southern agricultural center of Krasnodar this week, including greenhouses filled with wheat, and our CBC crew was invited along. I want this. Uh, most of Russians want this. What they want, says 23-year-old university student Roman Storestian, is for Putin to win on Sunday. He loves Russia. He protects us. And uh, we think we will be... Uh, better with him. 
He doesn't need to worry. Sunday's vote amounts to a rubber stamp for Putin. He banned his toughest adversary, Alexei Navalny, from challenging him. He hasn't bothered debating the candidates the Kremlin did approve or even releasing an election platform. About the only concern the Kremlin has is voter apathy. And away from the official events, we found lots of that in Krasnodar. You can see the color, deep red color. We met Andrei Kulikov. He left his marketing job in Moscow to pursue his dream of becoming a wine entrepreneur, a rare sector that's growing in Russia. But he's unhappy with smothering regulations and a lousy investment climate. I think uh, it would be better for a country if um, Russian government and Mr. Putin concentrate on the Russians' problem. For example, I'm not to understand why we go to the Syria. He says Russia needs someone new at the top. People are getting tired uh, during so many years. If you every day, uh, every many, many years do, do one thing, finally maybe you, you get tired and it would be better to change. That's remarkably frank talk. And we heard more of it on one of the city's main streets. Maybe this uh, first uh, or second uh, time when he was uh, president, it was uh, good, yes. And he did uh, very many from our country. But now I think uh, we have, we need a change. Still, Putin's nationalist themes, such as sticking up for Russia in a dangerous world, resonate and dominate. It's not become worse while Putin was in power, she says. I hope it will become better. There is no alternative, says this woman. If it's someone else, probably we would think in a different way. In the end, we didn't get a chance to put any questions to the president, but Roman Storestian did get to shake his hand. It was incredible. I, I will never forget this. Even if the number of dissatisfied is growing, Vladimir Putin can still count on a lot more true believers. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Well, true believers seem to be what Donald Trump is looking for as well. There are multiple reports suggesting the U.S. president is about to fire National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster. He's a senior cabinet member who disagrees with the boss often, and his departure would compound a number of other recent ones. Think Gary Cohn, Hope Hicks, and Rex Tillerson. The CBC's Keith Bogue joins me now from Washington. So, uh, Keith, a lot of changes at the senior level of the administration. Beyond the individuals themselves, what do you think the broader impact is here? I think the broader impact is going to be to change the personality of the senior levels of the administration and make it more like the personality of the president himself. You've got critics saying that the, some of the most important stabilizers in the administration are on their way out. By that, they mean Gary Cohn, the senior economic advisor who left last week. You've got Rex Tillerson, the uh, secretary of state, who was fired this week. And H.R. Uh, McMaster, who is considered to be on his way out very soon uh, as the national security advisor. And in their places, you've got people like Mike Pompeo from the CIA coming in uh, to the State Department. He's a more garrulous person, but also much more hawkish. You've got uh, Larry Kudlow, who's a television economist, coming in as the senior uh, economic advisor. And there's talk that John Bolton, who's a former diplomat and also now a TV pundit, might be the next national security advisor. So that's a much more Trumpian atmosphere inside the administration. Uh, and that, I think, is part of what the objective was. And, and you know, Keith, we're, we're going to keep circling back to this planned face-to-face -face between Trump and North Korea's Kim Jong-un. I'm curious, you know, isn't this taking a big risk to make this sort of sweeping change ahead of a pretty critical summit? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, found, I think many people are stunned that you would even consider changing your national security advisor and your secretary of state and all in the run-up to this critical meeting uh, with, with uh, the leader of North Korea. Uh, then you have to consider the people that are coming into those spots, like we've talked about Mike Pompeo being more hawkish. Well, you know, he thinks on North Korea that regime change is the answer there. If uh, John Bolton were to come in, he's somebody who's talked about a military strike against North 
Korea, and he thinks the bombing should have begun like yesterday. So if you're Kim Jong-un watching these things, just imagine what you're thinking. This will certainly be a more Trumpian government than it was. Okay. The CBC's Keith Bogue in Washington. Thanks very much. Thank you. Now, th there have been so many departures from the Trump White House. Online betting sites are starting to give odds on who will be fired next. There are pretty good odds on H.R. McMaster. But there's also speculation about Veterans Affairs Secretary David Shulkin, Housing Secretary Ben Carson, Environmental Protection Agency Administrator Scott Pruitt, Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke, and Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Well, here at home, there may be another front in this country's conversation about minimum wage. After the controversy over how Tim Horton's owners were paying their employees, some WestJet flight attendants are coming forward with their concerns. They say they work a lot more hours than they actually get paid for, and one union says the company could be breaking labour rules. CBC's Kyle Bax has the details. Some flight attendants at WestJet say their pay is falling behind because they're only paid from wheels up to wheels down. Flight attendants CBC News has spoken to complain they don't get paid for all the work they do during pre-flight preparation or after landing. We've agreed to protect this flight attendant's identity because she fears losing her job for speaking out. Everybody was up in arms over the Tim Hortons workers who deserve better and don't cut their benefits, something like that. I'm like, what about the person who's responsible for your safety on an aircraft? Here's what she says is unfair. Take a one-hour flight from Calgary to Vancouver. The flight attendant arrives at the airport and prepares the plane for boarding. It's wheels up for one hour. Then after landing with WestJet, the cabin crew has to clean the aircraft. That's about four hours from start to finish while only being paid for one. Some flight attendants say there is the problem. Starting wage is about $26 an hour. Divide that by four and it's well below minimum wage. Flight attendants aren't paid to do their safety checks. They're not paid to board a plane. They're not paid to deplane a plane. So, and we're not paid for all the time in between flights where we sit and wait. Unlike WestJet, most airlines pay a minimum of at least four hours. Experts say the company may be violating federal labour rules nice. to pay employees for all hours worked, not just one activity. WestJet cannot limit their hourly wages to just the hours in the sky. They have to pay them for every hour worked. That's the law. WestJet declined our interview requests, but in a statement it says compensation for its cabin crew is generous and compares favourably to carriers of a similar size. The airline does provide full-time staff with benefits, an optional share purchase program, and profit sharing when the airline is making money. Labour experts say it's high time the aviation industry changes the way staff are paid. Oh, I think it's clear there needs to be a change. So the reason the employer's been able to get away with it, I think, uh, is because it hasn't been challenged before. WestJet's labour situation is up in the air. Pilots have unionized and are negotiating their first contract, and efforts to organize the flight attendants are underway. Kyle Bax, CBC News, Calgary. If those efforts go through, WestJet flight attendants will have a lot of company. Air Canada's cabin crew has been unionized for years, and so have crews with most of the major U.S. airlines, including American, Alaska, Southwest, and United. Delta is one of the few major North American airlines that has yet to reach an agreement. And ahead tonight on The National, we'll take you to a tiny town in Newfoundland that represents a big cost to the province. That's why it's actually paying people to leave. But you'll meet two people who are standing firm and staying put. And for years, he's lived with a rare kidney disease, desperately searching for a match for an organ donation. Until now a life-saving deal with a complete stranger. But first, groundbreaking research puts amputees back in touch with their world. It was uh, a very strange sensation to actually be able to, to feel that, that feedback, because I, I hadn't in 10 years. Well, most of us pick up a glass or shake someone's hand without a second thought. But for people with a prosthetic hand, even simple actions can be hard to gauge or control. Just think about it. You can't actually feel what you're touching. But as Nicole Ireland shows us, researchers think they've found a way to help. 
Rob Anderson fights wildfires for the Alberta government. Almost 12 years ago, the helicopter he was riding in crashed into a mountain. And in that crash, I lost my left arm and my left leg. With the help of prosthetic limbs, Anderson was able to get back to firefighting and living as normal a life as possible. But despite technological advances in prosthetics, his motorized hand can only do so much. I quite often compare using my body power, the hook, as to uh, operating, doing things with a long pair of pliers. You're working at a little bit of a distance, right? There's that disconnect between what you're physically touching and what your body is doing. That's because if we're grabbing or moving something, we actually rely on the sensation we get from our hand to tell our brain if we're doing it accurately. You and I, when we open and close our hand and move, our brain naturally just absorbs you know, thousands of inputs from our skin and muscles and joints. Amputees don't have that. They're disconnected from that motorized prosthesis. Dr. Jacqueline Hebert has teamed up with the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, as well as the University of New Brunswick, to conduct a study to try to solve that problem. Anderson is one of her patients, and one of six people with arm amputations who took part. When an amputee with a motorized hand thinks about grabbing an object, the hand responds, but the person can't feel it. In this study, the researchers used small devices to vibrate specific muscles in the amputee's upper arm or chest. That created the illusion that the person can sense the movement in their artificial hand. We're looking at ways of providing... The researchers said that can help amputees feel more like the artificial hand is part of them. It was uh, a very strange sensation to actually be able to, to feel that that feedback, because I, I hadn't in 10 years. It grasps objects, so Feeling the sensation of movement also let the participants move their prosthetic hands with greater precision. They were able to control their grasp function and how much they were opening the hand to the same degree that someone with an intact hand would. For Anderson, the technology has big implications for everyday tasks. I think if you could reach out and touch something with your prosthetic limb and know how much pressure you're putting on it, you know, then you're not crushing water bottles, you're not dropping things. The researchers acknowledged that they looked at a very small group of patients with very specific types of arm amputations. They're hoping for the next phase of their study, they'll be able to see if this technology can benefit a much broader group of people who use all kinds of different prosthetics. Nicole Ireland, CBC News, Toronto. Pretty fascinating research. Well, still to come on The National. Canadian labels have become fashionable in Turkey, but these aren't designer labels, they're industrial. And Newfoundland and Labrador is paying people to abandon tiny communities. I totally get why people want to leave. I totally get why there's some people that might want to stay. I think it's a bad program, primarily because it, it, it targets rural Newfoundland to depopulate it. Tonight on The National, new details about that deadly bridge collapse in Miami. Officials in Florida say that two days before the collapse, an engineer called to report cracking on the walkway. That report was left as a voicemail message for a Florida Department of Transportation employee. But that employee was out of the office and didn't receive the message until today. Here's what they heard when they picked up the phone. Uh, I was calling to uh, share with you some information about the FIU pedestrian bridge and some cracking that's been observed on the north end of the span, the pylon end of that uh, span we moved this weekend. Um, so uh, we've taken a look at it and uh, obviously some repairs or whatever will have to be done, but from a safety perspective, we don't see that there's any issue there. So far, six people have been confirmed dead, but authorities warn today they think it's very likely they'll find more bodies. Officials say they're working carefully to remove the rubble so that the scene is preserved for investigators. And this was a skier's nightmare in the country of Georgia today at a ski resort. According to witnesses, it all happened pretty quickly. The ski lift suddenly shifting into reverse and going dangerously fast. You can see some people managed to jump off, others got thrown off, at least eight people were hurt, and the ski lift manufacturer is trying to figure out what went wrong. Well, don't let the photographs fool you. This is a community with 
No doctor, no store, barely any people. But what the pictures show that even a dying town can be a very hard place to leave. The map of Canada is dotted with small isolated communities, many on the brink of extinction. And tonight, we'll tell you about one of them and why. We're headed to Little Bay Islands off Newfoundland. It's one of dozens of outports where the province wants to move people out and save on services. But as Chris O'Neill Yates discovered, some residents are down on packing up. Looks like a good day for skiing anyway. Yeah, Mike Parsons is living his dream. How did you get down without falling down? Ferry didn't run this morning. He and his wife Georgina have made their own okay, private so skating good. loop on the harbor. They moved back to retire early in Little Bay Islands at the same time as nearly everyone else is getting ready to leave. In the winter, there are only 46 people who live here. Myself and Georgina, we wanted to become part of the community while it still existed as a community. We absolutely love it. We're outdoors people, we ski, we skate, we snowmobile, we're boating people. So all the things that we love to do are here in Outport, Newfoundland. Money can't buy the happiness that this place brings us. Little Bay Islands is breathtakingly beautiful, but the province believes it can save money by resettling towns like this. The new resettlement policy has the government offering its residents up to $270,000 to move to bigger communities. It will save millions of dollars. The decision to stay or go has created a rift among the handful of residents. I totally get why people want to leave. I totally get why there's some people that might want to stay. I think it's a bad program primarily because it, it, it targets rural Newfoundland to depopulate it. It's the isolated ones, the small ones, the ones that to a large degree, by the way, are a major attraction to tourists coming to this province. Peter Fenwick is an innkeeper. He's also the mayor of Cape St. George, which is about 370 kilometers away from Little Bay Islands. He's a vocal critic of resettlement. So what happens is people stay, even if they don't want to stay. And the whole program works in entirely the opposite direction of what some foolish bureaucrat has designed it to do. In some cases, Fenwick says people are holding off moving until they can get the government payouts. That only happens when 90% of residents are on board. It may take a decade for some communities, but under the program, they'll get paid much more to leave than their properties are worth. I would hope that the government would say our deficit is now $2 billion and we can't afford to do this anymore. Take Little Bay Islands. There the government built a ferry that was too big and costly to start with. It was built for more than $27 million in 2011 and it's more than $16,500 to operate per person per year. Some bureaucrat or some politician in the past has decided that we're going to have this big fancy boat and then we're going to make sure that there's a cook on it who makes $100,000 a year and that virtually the entire crew does. So it's, it's not the blame of the people in the small communities. It's, it's the government's poor policies that have made it so expensive. In fact, today, my videographer and I were the only ones taking the boat on our return trip. About 500 kilometers away, this community took matters into its own hands. Centerville, on its own, was not a viable community, but it amalgamated with two others in 1992. Now a combined 1,100 people live here. The Noble family has been manufacturing wood products for 40 years. Shane Noble's relatives already resettled once from a nearby island in the 1950s. He moved to Ontario for a while, but came back to run the family business 15 years ago. After I moved back, I brought four families back home. I was like, I've got an opportunity. You can you come back. Yeah. Every one of them did. The community itself could easily disappear, but there's five or six manufacturers here. There's different people here with the mentality that we want to be here. So we create our own opportunities. One of the new opportunities he's pursuing is a line of affordable modular furniture. 
people just don't understand how much opportunity there is in Outport. And that's where Alexa Perry comes in. As a child, she moved out of Newfoundland when her parents lost their jobs in the cod collapse. I mean, if I told anybody that I was moving to Newfoundland to do marketing, they'd think I was insane. Um, and turns out there's plenty of opportunity here to do marketing. When I come back here to visit and see that that's what's happening, that people are leaving the communities and there's that threat of that history dying, well, I think that's the exact reason that I feel compelled to come back because those roots are still important to me. So Noble believes uh, there are other reasons that make yeah, living here attractive. We're talking some large corporations who have executives that live in rural Newfoundland simply because we have internet, it's an hour's drive to, to the airport in, say, in Gander, so it's high paying jobs that live here. I take tons and tons of pictures every day in the hundreds of pictures. What I'm trying to do with my pictures is, is kind of create some of that emotional connection to Little Bay Islands. You know, Little Bay Islands cousin doesn't get lost. The Parsons have a plan for after the provincial government cuts off all services. So when the ferry stops, we have our own 42-foot uh, longliner, so we can travel uh, pretty much year-round. We have uh, three deep freezes in the basement, and one is full of fish. Moving into a community that is emptying out is not for everyone. But Parsons believes there's more to life here. These islands and these communities have so much to offer that for people that want to get away from a busy lifestyle, from living in cities or living in parts of the world where they want to get back to the land and they want to experience a slower pace of life. A life where he and his wife will have the entire island to themselves. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Little Bay Islands, Newfoundland. Well, we saw some stunning photographs of Little Bay Islands in that story. They were taken by Mike Parsons, and we posted more on our Instagram feed. Just some of the images we share every day. Make sure you give us a follow at CBC The National. Well, today was the due date, and the paperwork is in for soccer fans hoping to bring the 2026 FIFA World Cup to North America. And Canada might have a piece of it. Edmonton, Toronto and Montreal are now officially in the running as part of a joint North American bid. The idea, strength in numbers. The joint bid includes a total of 23 cities across Canada, the US and Mexico. We'll know the outcome in June. There's only one other bid in the running, Morocco, also vying to host. But if the North America joint bid is successful, Canada and Mexico would each host 10 games, while the United States would get the other 60. The World Cup brings in huge audiences around the world. More than a billion people tuned in when it was held in Brazil four years ago. So host cities stand to make a lot of money through tourism and taxes. But worth noting, that wasn't enough to entice British Columbia. The province effectively pulled Vancouver out of the running earlier this week, arguing that signing on to FIFA's terms would be like handing over a blank check. There's very large concerns uh, with the bid, uh, one of them being uh, the ability for FIFA to unilaterally change the stadium agreement at any point. That adds unknown costs and unknown risks to the BC taxpayers. And Vancouver wasn't alone. Chicago and Minneapolis followed suit, both calling out FIFA's unwillingness to negotiate. The US, the Russians, the Turks, the Iranians, the Israelis over and with each other in Syria. The US, the UK, Russia issue, cyber, um, even the potential for growing trade confrontation. I don't know which of these is going to break, but we're not going to get through a few years without some major problems. Ian Bremmer's business is advising clients on political risk, and as he made clear when I spoke with him today, it is a growth industry. With so many tensions brewing in so many places, we wanted to get his take on where we need to pay attention and why. Bremmer had a lot to talk about, starting with North Korea and the stunning announcement last week from Donald Trump that he plans to meet directly with North Korea's supreme leader, Kim Jong-un. Well, first of all, we don't know if there's going to be a summit. Uh, we know that Trump announced that he was ready to have a summit, and that was a week ago. 
and uh, there has been radio silence uh, from the North Koreans. They're usually pretty ready to talk uh, about whatever they want when they feel like it. I don't think that they've decided that they're ready for this meeting. So let's, let's see uh, if it's going to happen or not. I, I think the fact that um, we've had so much uncertainty and change uh, in the cabinet in the United States, Tillerson out, McMaster about to be. You don't have key uh, South Korean um, envoys uh, and senior advisors in place in the White House or the State Department. Um, that's a big problem. And certainly, uh, President Trump deserves credit for uh, pushing the Chinese towards uh, tougher sanctions against North Korea. That wouldn't have happened under Obama or Bush. Uh, he also deserves credit for making the North Koreans fear that a preemptive strike was on the table. And I think that helped to bring the North Koreans uh, into a more conciliatory stance with South Korea over the Olympics and after, and potentially with the United States as well. Um, so I do think that there is a larger chance than there has been uh, that we could have a diplomatic breakthrough. But there's also a larger chance we could end up at war. Uh, there's a reason why Obama and Bush and Clinton have decided, and Bush Sr., all decided they didn't really want their presidency about North Korea, and they weren't going to put a lot at stake in trying to resolve it. And it's because they knew how hard it was. And they also knew the dangers were pretty great. So even though it was getting worse, they kicked it to the next president. And Trump didn't do that. He doesn't know a lot about foreign policy. He's more risk acceptant. Um, and uh, I do think that uh, saying that you're going to meet with Kim Jong-un and making your presidency, the success of your presidency, more about North Korea is potentially a very dangerous thing and makes it more likely that we end up uh, in a direct military confrontation uh, with uh, the most militarized authoritarian regime uh, in, the, in the world. You know, we spoke earlier in the program about the changes uh, in Trump's cabinet. W what impact is that going to have on his foreign policy? I think Pompeo is actually a pretty strong and solid citizen. Uh, he clearly will be a better manager of state uh, than Tillerson was, and he will be more effective at pushing into the key meetings in the White House. He'll have more, more influence in the White House. He'll get more resources. But uh, ideologically, he is much more hawkish than Tillerson was on Iran, on North Korea, on China, on Russia, on Israel, Palestine, on a host of issues. And I also think he'll be more of an enabler, a more like Secretary of Treasury Mnuchin, whose view is uh, whatever Trump's instinct is, that's right, we're going to go with that, as opposed to pushing back. Tillerson was more than willing to tell Trump on the many occasions that he thought Trump was simply wrong on foreign policy. And by the way, I think frequently Trump is wrong on foreign policy. He just doesn't have the background, and he isn't interested in developing the expertise. That's a problem. Now, if you have smart people around you that make decisions, so for example, on defense and security, you've got Secretary Mattis, and Trump has generally been willing to defer to Mattis for his advice on key issues like uh, the bombing of Syria after their use of chemical weapons. And by the way, I thought that was one of the best uh, foreign policy moves that Trump has made since he's become president. But it's not clear to me that he will do that on broader foreign policy issues. Um, and I think that combined with uh, Pompeo in place and McMaster leaving uh, clearly elevates my concerns about geopolitical confrontation. Andrew, I should point out, Bremer is the first to say he's no alarmist. In fact, he actually considers himself an optimist. But with what's happening in Russia and North Korea, clearly he's worried. Yeah, and also, I mean, interesting to hear him praise at least some of Trump's foreign policy moves. But uh, yeah, as we heard overall, he feels the, uh, the threat has increased. OK, let's move now to a good news story. A 78-year-old veteran in British Columbia handed something very precious today. Zora Singh Tatla, who served in the Indian Army for 28 years, he lost his military medals last Remembrance Day in Surrey. He just got home and, and noticed that they were gone. So the RCMP ended up calling on the public for help. And this afternoon, Tatla got those medals back. Uh, so I'm very happy to return your medals to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome.
So Tatla, who spoke through a translator, thanked the police for their work. Uh, he also added he'll probably be holding on to his medals a little more closely from now on. Toronto police confirmed tonight that Headley frontman Jacob Hogard is under investigation and that the sex crimes unit is involved. Earlier this year, two women came forward to CBC News accusing him of sexual misconduct. Hogard has denied the allegations, saying the encounters were consensual. British counterterrorism police are now treating the death of a Russian businessman in London as murder. But they say that does not mean there's a connection between this case and the poisoning of former Russian spy, Sergei Skripal and his daughter in Salisbury. Nikolai Glushkov was found dead in his London home on Monday. A post-mortem has determined he died from neck compression. The 68-year-old was living in exile in the UK and was a vocal critic of Vladimir Putin. <laughs> Civilians continue to flee eastern Ghouta. According to the Russian military, about 4,000 evacuees escaped a recent offensive. According to monitors, 80 people were killed in Russia-backed government airstrikes today alone. Monitors also reported 27 dead near the northwest Syrian town of Afrin. Thousands of weary evacuees moved to safer ground amid a weeks-old Turkish offensive against the Kurdish militia known as the YPG. Turkey considers the YPG a terrorist organization bent on establishing a Kurdish state in both Syria and Turkey. Today, the UN expressed deep concern over Afrin's humanitarian situation, where there is only one fully functioning hospital. Well, Turkey has a garbage problem. A recent report found it produces enough waste every year to fill the Roman Colosseum 44 times. But a team of designers is trying to change that by turning trash into trendy accessories. And as Neil Cooksall found out, their shelves are stocked with items that originated on Canadian farms. İstanbul'un dünyada tükenildi aslında. Dünyada bilinen imajından daha modern halinde yansıtmak adına bir faaliyet de yola çıkılmış bir e, marka. More than, say, Turkish coffee and the Ottoman Empire, designer Bedirhan Çakır says, a modern alternative. But at the shop he manages, called 100% Istanbul, even he was surprised Canadian products would help him do it. En çok hoşumuza giden noktalar malzemenin renkli olması. İkinci bir aslında bizim en büyük sevindiğimiz noktası da çok dayanıklı malzemeler olması. Their industrial sacks used to ship tons of grains and pulses. Chakur and his team will turn them into these for sale from about 10 to 100 Canadian dollars here in the city's cool Bayola district. What they're doing is known as upcycling, not just reusing an item, but making it into something more valuable. Kanadalı turistler ülkemizi çok fazla ziyaret ediyor. Buradan geçerken, vitrinlere bakarken bir anda Kanada logosunu görünce onlar da çok şaşırıyorlar. But Chakır says the novelty comes with a nudge. Aslında bilerek yaptığımız bir durum değil ama toplumun ve ülkenin durumunu da bir yandan da özetleyen, dolaylı bir şekilde de olsa anlatan bir durum. Traditionally in Turkey, using everything to its fullest, not wasting a thing was part of this country's fabric. But it seems many Turks have lost that recycling reflex, and the lessons of past generations seem to be fading. Like in a lot of places around the world now, quick consumption is the norm. Last year, a UK-based market research group ranked Turkey as Europe's most wasteful country, saying it sends more than 32 million tons of waste straight to landfills. Conscientious Turks and individual municipalities are doing what they can to cut back and clean up, and rounding up recyclables is its own profession for some. But clearly, it's not enough. The shop's bags also underline another sore spot, agriculture, and how much Turkey is outsourcing, lentils in particular. 236,000 tons of lentils came from Canada to Turkey between 2014 and 15. Turkey's own lentils are expensive so it exports most of the more than 300,000 tons it produces. Chakur knows these designs can't solve all of the country's problems, but he hopes they might get people thinking. Yes, there are 
daha iyi şekilde yapılabilir. Bunlarla alakalı çalışan, çabalayan insanlar da var. Bu da bizi çok mutlu ediyor. Hani bu düşünceyi burada bir de görüp benimseyip kendi hayatında bir şeyi değiştirirse bile bu bir de güzel bir şey. Neil Köksal, CBC News, İstanbul. A Nova Scotia man in search of a kidney thought he had exhausted all of his options, but then he turned to social media and as luck would have it, he met a stranger who just happened to be a match. And their story is our moment of the day. Uh, it got to a point where I decided I need to ask for help and social media and Facebook was the, the easy answer. My head was in a particular place at that particular time in my life. And then, coincidentally, his story floated by. I said, what's that? Somebody had to do something. Can that be me? It turned out yes. We approached that early on, that, OK, we're going to take this one step at a time. And Jeff just kept going to appointments and kept trying, and we kept getting the right answer. And now we're four days away from <laughs> surgery. Common good of helping people uh, it's, it's the thing that's really getting me, and it's, it's come, I mean, obviously from Jeff, but it's, it's come from everybody around us. You know, Ian, this is such a, a, a striking story in, in so many ways. And, and I'll say the nice thing is that as far as transplants go, kidney transplants do tend to go exceedingly well. There's a, a very high success rate there, and they, it tends to be a gift that, that keeps on giving, according to the Kidney Foundation of Canada. A kidney, uh, generally, from a living donor, tends to last 15 to 20 years on average. And, and I think most of the people who are on that transplant list need kidneys, but man, it is a huge risk to be involved in the surgery for a stranger to agree to do that. It, you know, a lot of us give money, a lot of us give time, but to, to do what he's doing is remarkable. It is, absolutely. Uh, that is The National for this March 16th. Thanks so much for joining us, folks. Good night.